from the headquarters of Telesur English in Quito, Ecuador. I'm Carla Gonzalez and this is From the South. Chinese President Xi Jinping has arrived in Moscow for a three-day state visit as ties between the two countries have grown ever stronger. Xi met President Vladimir Putin at the Kremlin and both leaders praised their close relations. On Thursday, Xi is expected to travel to St. Petersburg to attend an economic forum hosted by Putin. The two leaders will later sign a joint declaration on global partnership and strategic cooperation with the hopes of entering a new era. Last year we set a goal to reach $100 billion of bilateral commodities trade. Due to the efforts of our teams, our two governments, we exceeded that number and we reached $108 billion. And this year, in the first quarter, trade is also on the increase. It is already up by more than 3.4%. Our bilateral relations have not yet reached the maximum and can become even better. We are ready to work together with Russia in order to continuously increase the impact of our countries. High-level cooperation so that our cooperation could give our two peoples a greater sense of achievement and so that we can promote the Russian-Chinese agenda in international affairs. The leaders also addressed a number of strategic international issues, including the political situation in Venezuela. President Putin said he is working together with his Chinese counterpart to stabilize the situation in Venezuela. Leader, my honorable friend. Our correspondent in Moscow, Hans Eloro, is following the visit by the Chinese president. The state visit by the Chinese president Xi Jinping has begun with a meeting with his Russian counterpart. Vladimir Putin welcomed him to the Kremlin and referred to him as a great friend to Russia. Putin also mentioned the growing trade between Russia and China, which last year reached record levels of more than $100 billion, $108 billion to be precise. But in addition to bilateral relations, the two leaders are also talking about major international issues. Both Russia and China are, of course, permanent members of the UN Security Council and often act together on questions like Syria, the situation in Venezuela, and the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. Both countries have played a key role in developing a roadmap for the talks between President Donald Trump and the North Korean leader Kim Jong-un, who of course also had a historic meeting with President Putin in Vladivostok recently. So President Xi and Putin will be talking about all these strategic issues and are expected to sign some 30 agreements most of them in areas of economic and commercial relations. As an official gift, Xi Jinping gave two giant pandas to the Moscow Zoo as a symbol of the close friendship between China and Russia. President Xi is also meeting other Russian leaders, he's attending a gala at the Bolshoi Theater, and on Thursday he's taking part in an economic forum in St. Petersburg that will continue until Saturday. In parallel, there will also be an energy forum with large delegations of Chinese and Russian experts taking part. We should remember that this strengthening of relations is particularly important because it comes as the United States continues to impose its sanctions on Russia and is stepping up its trade war against China. That was Hansel Oro from Moscow. And in, other, in other news, as the U.S. economic blockade on Cuba worsens, the Cuban government continues to strengthen its ties with Russia. We have more in this report. During an official meeting at the Kremlin, Cuban and Russian authorities reviewed the fulfillment of bilateral agreements, and they confirmed their commitment to further cooperation. These talks and the links we establish are of utmost importance to us. We are accomplishing the goals established by our leaders. We are intensifying and diversifying economic ties. The Russian Deputy Prime Minister spoke about the need to strengthen cooperation to overcome unilateral sanctions imposed by the U.S. I would like to point out how difficult Cuba's situation is at the moment, thanks to U.S. economy sanctions and to the pressure being exerted on the Venezuelan economy. 
Before this meeting, the vice president of Cuba's Ministers' Council spoke with the Russian Agriculture Minister about strengthening the island's food crop production with the help of equipment and products from Russia. Esteemed Mr. Cabrisas, we are interested in exporting meat, grain, and other produce to Cuba. Cooperation in commerce as well as in the automotive, pharmaceutical, railway, and high-tech industries are some of the goals of these meetings. But above all else, they serve to cement discontent with the U.S. aggressions against aggressive governments in Latin America and the rest of the world. The president of Venezuela, Nicolás Maduro, has summoned the country's National Defense Council, declaring a permanent session in the wake of multiple coup attempts. Alongside representatives of the government, President Maduro declared that the council would guarantee the protection of the Bolivarian Republic against any attempt to destabilize it. He also addressed new elections for the National Assembly and negotiations with the opposition in Norway. The country wants the renewal of the National Assembly. It's a special theme for the Security Council. It's something that we're talking about in the Oslo negotiations. Venezuela wants elections to stabilize itself, to recover the time lost, and to heal the country's legislative body. President Maduro said the Council will be in permanent session to counter the threat of further U.S.-backed coup attempts. Above all, this plan allows us to contain and defeat any destabilization or coup attempts from the United States. We have the power, the conviction, the reason and the moral right to succeed in doing so. We will ask God to give us the wisdom necessary for the Security and Defense Council to be able to take the initiatives our nation needs. Finally, the president condemned the Venezuelan opposition for aligning themselves with the United States and their imperialist aspirations. Their conspiracy to hurt the country from inside continues and is entering a phase of madness and exasperation. I condemn North American imperialism and the traitors by their side before the country and before the world. They've entered a new phase of madness and frustration. Mexico's foreign minister Marcelo Ebrard is expected to meet U.S. authorities, including Vice President Mike Pence and Secretary of State Mike Pompeo in Washington, D.C. They are expected to hold talks on immigration and tariff threats made by President Donald Trump last week. He said that the U.S. would impose a 5% tariff on all Mexican imports starting June 10 and would raise to 25% by October. During a press briefing on Tuesday, Mexico's foreign minister said he hoped to find common ground with U.S. officials. Following days of mass protests, teachers and doctors in Honduras plan to end their strike as they have agreed to hold talks with the government. Still, teachers and health workers unions say they will remain on alert. The government initially sought to hold separate meetings with the unions, but they demanded that all negotiations be held together. The unions protested the government's announcement of two emergency decrees to privatize both the health and education. The Institute of Legal Medicine in Nicaragua has concluded that a skeletal remains found in the department of Carazo match with Bismarck Martinez, a Sandinista who was kidnapped during the 2018 failed coup. Analysis of genetic markers showed that the remains coincided with the DNA of the children and brothers of the victim. The case of Bismarck Martinez made a big impact in Nicaragua since he was known for representing innocent people who suffered at the hands of violent right-wing opposition groups. The attempts to destabilize the Sandinista government of Daniel Ortega began in April 2018 and lasted months. 15 polymorphic genetic markers were analyzed in order to determine the identity, and 25 polymorphic genetic markers were subsequently analyzed. These two types of analysis allow for the determination of the affiliation that exists between the family members of Bismarck Martinez. Peru's Congress is continuing to debate a motion of confidence presented by President Martin Vizcarra. Talks resumed on Wednesday on the President's attempt to push through a package of anti-corruption reforms, which a majority in Congress has been resisting. However, a number of parties have come out in support of the motion. 
Biscarra needs 66 votes in order to pass it. If the motion is approved, the law will also be passed. If it isn't, the president could dissolve Congress. Tijani Muhammad Bande, Nigeria's permanent representative to the United Nations, has been elected as president of the 74th General Assembly. He will succeed Ecuador's representative, Maria Fernanda Espinosa. Bande will preside over the 74th session of the 193-member General Assembly, one of the UN's highest policy-making bodies. The newly elected UNGA president vows to tackle a number of issues during his tenure, including climate change, universal health coverage, gender equality and poverty. The session is scheduled to kick off in September. The major priority of my presidency. Coming up, we have celebrations around the world for the end of the holy month of Ramadan. So don't go away. Environment Day. Welcome back. Barbados is ready to give up its majority ownership of the financially troubled regional airline Liat and hand it back to Antigua and Barbuda. Prime Minister Mia Modley made the announcement in Parliament on Tuesday evening, ending weeks of speculation. Liat is owned by 11 Caribbean governments. Barbados is the largest single shareholder with a 49.9% stake in the airline. Marley confirmed to the House that Barbados has accepted an offer from Prime Minister Gaston Brown to take up most of its majority stake. We have accepted an offer from a sister Caribbean state, Antigua and Barbuda, to we enter into negotiations with them to see whether a deal can be concluded with respect to Antigua and Barbuda taking up our shares in exchange for them taking up our responsibilities as a shareholder within the context of LIAC. This will require negotiations on the part of both countries and therefore we will be writing Prime Minister Brown to indicate that just as he has established a negotiating team, the government of Barbados will establish a negotiating team that will meet with his negotiating team to settle the terms if we can Still in Barbados, the island plans to do away with the secondary school's entrance examination, known as Common Entrance, SEA, or 11 plus exam. Barbadian academics, such as Professor of Education Joel Warrican, have described the UK inherited test as unjust because of its elitist construct. He says the exam was initially designed to ensure the best white students go to the top schools but pupils who can afford tutoring often have a leg up on those who cannot. The state funeral for Jamaica's former Prime Minister Edward Siaga will take place on Sunday, June 23rd. The government has announced that the service will be held at the Holy Trinity Cathedral in Greater Kingston, known as the corporate area. A national period of mourning has also been declared from June 19th to the 22nd. Ahead of the funeral, Siaga's body will lie in state at several locations. Siaga, Jamaica's first prime minister, died last Tuesday following a battle with cancer. Muslims around the world are celebrating Eid al-Fitr, marking the end of the holy month of Ramadan. 
In Trinidad and Tobago, Muslims and even non-Muslims are celebrating one of the most joyous days in the Islamic calendar by giving back to society. After the time of feasting to mark the end of the month-long fasts, Muslims give special charitable contributions known as Zakat al-Fitr. It often takes the form of food and other items. Muslims throughout the island also attend mosque services and learn of the Quran's teachings. Eid, also known as the festival of breaking the fast, starts with the sighting of the new moon and celebrations begin with special morning prayers. Thousands of Palestinians living in Israeli-occupied territories flocked to the holy Al-Aska Mosque to pray. Then they headed to the graveyards at an Asian Muslim cemetery to remember their loved ones. President Mahmoud Abbas joined prayers in the occupied West Bank, wishing for the liberation of Palestine. Best wishes to all of us for a happy aid with health and safety God willing. To our people and nation, believe our country will be liberated and returned to us. When the state of Palestine is established and in its capital East Jerusalem, by God's will. In Iran, Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei led prayers in front of thousands at the Imam Khomeini Mausoleum in Tehran. During his sermon, the leader strongly criticized both Bahrain and Saudi Arabia for, quote, enabling U.S. plans in the region. Iran has become a main target for U.S. President Donald Trump as his government continues to mount threats and economic sanctions on the nation. Muslims in Sri Lanka also gather to celebrate the end of the holy month of Ramadan. These celebrations come under the shadow of recent anti-Muslim riots and campaigns against Muslim political leaders, which is sparked after the deadly Easter Sunday bombings, which left over 250 dead. On Monday, Muslim ministers resigned their posts amidst thre threats as anti-Muslim groups have called for the boycott of Muslim-owned businesses. On one hand, we pray that good things happen to those affected by the attacks. On the other hand, we pray that those who are actually responsible be exposed to the war and be destroyed. Syrian President Bashar al-Assad joined morning prayers at the mosque of President Hafez al-Assad in Damascus. Assad was accompanied by a number of government officials. Eid celebrations in Syria come as government forces continue to secure villages in the provinces of Idlib and Hama. And as Muslims celebrate Eid al-Fitr in Sudan, the head of the Transitional Military Council has offered to continue negotiations with the opposition alliance. The announcement comes one day after he scrapped all agreements made with the opposition. It's also two days after security forces reportedly killed 60 people who were staging a sitting protest outside the military headquarters. Protests have been ongoing in Sudan since the ousting of former President Omar al-Bashir, with protesters demanding that the military council hand over power to a civilian-led government. Free citizens the past few days have witnessed sorrowful events resulting from the Joint Security Force efforts to deal with certain threats and security complications. Unfortunately, events unfollowed resulting in the fall of victims and of the injured. We are sorry for what happened. We pray for the souls of the martyrs and hope the quickest of recoveries for the wounded. The general prosecutor has been directed towards investigating these events. The necessary legal measures will be taken as soon as possible, as we cannot allow any circumstances to stand in the way of achieving the goals of the revolution. And in the Democratic Republic of Congo, the country's Muslim minority is urging the government to push for peace in the eastern regions as they gather to celebrate the end of Ramadan. Clashes have been going ongoing in the east of the DRC between the Muslim minority and other religious groups. This comes as the country is experiencing an Ebola epidemic with at least 2,000 cases confirmed so far. More stories coming up and cricket fans, stay tuned as we'll bring you the updated scores on today's Cricket World Cup matches. Stay with us.
a quest in the nature to find their roots. Nosotros somos parte de la de un mismo mundo. Somos parte de la Pachamama, ¿no? Telesur Documentaries presents Radical Friends Sunday Only on Telesur Welcome back. On the final day of his state visit to the UK, US President Donald Trump has joined a number of leaders in Portsmouth, England, to commemorate the 75th anniversary of D-Day. Also known as the Normandy landings, it was the day US troops disembarked in France during World War II. Among the leaders joining Trump are French President Emmanuel Macron, German Chancellor Angela Merkel, and outgoing British Prime Minister Theresa May. After the event, President Trump left for Ireland for what is expected to be a short meeting with the Irish PM before heading back to the U.S. The Islamic State group has confirmed their presence in Mozambique for the first time, announcing its fighters had repelled an army attack in the north of the country. Since 2017, the district of Cabo Delgado has faced growing attacks with over 200 people killed and many villages torched. A police spokesperson says security forces are committed to ensuring public security. We reiterate that security forces are located throughout the national territory and are carrying out operations to guarantee order and public security in the national territory and ensure that people circulate in an atmosphere of peace and tranquility. In South Africa, members of the Youth League of the African National Congress have taken to the streets of Johannesburg calling for a new leadership. Protesters are demanding to participate in new elections. They have accused the current leadership of failing to adequately assess the interests of young people. The group has vowed to continue protesting until their demands are met. Now let's take a look at more stories from around the world. People remain missing in Indonesia after a cargo boat they were in sank on Saturday. The vessel capsized with 18 people on board. According to authorities, on Tuesday one person was found by a passing vessel floating in a life jacket and is now receiving medical treatment. Today we conduct search and rescue operations with the objective of finding victims from the sinking of the Kiem Lintas Timur, which was suspected to have sunk in Maluku waters. In Thailand, former Democratic Party leader Abhishek Bejajiba has announced his resignation as a member of parliament. This comes after his party threw their support behind Prayut Chan Ocha as the next prime minister. A vote for a new prime minister will take place for the first time since the 2014 coup. The Democrat Party has decided to join the coalition pro-military government and support Prayut Chan Ocha as prime minister. With respect to the party's resolution, I'm still against the decision. I'm resigning as a member of parliament from now on. Meanwhile in Russia, the China Railway Construction Corporation has created over 1,000 jobs under the Belt and Road Initiative. As one of the many projects co-handled by China and Russia, the Metro project is the first in Russia to be given to a foreign company. Moscow's metro is a testament to the cooperation and people-to-people -people exchange between the two nations. I enjoyed working here because during the last two years I was promoted quite a lot. Because two years ago when I started working here I was in a quite low position, but still I have um, some opportunity and I catch this one. Our company giving this opportunity to all people. And for sports we have the Cricket World Cup scores for today. India is battling to make a comeback against South Africa. South Africa's captain Faf Du Plessis won the toss and elected to bat first at the Southampton Stadium. But from the start, India's bowler Yusvendra Shahal, with help from Jaspreet Mumra, restricted South Africa to 227 for nine. 
India are now batting and are on 141 for three. South Africa have already lost two games in the World Cup. And before we go, we bring you the story of the Emmanuel's Queen Women's Football Academy in Nigeria, which hopes to raise the next generation of female football players. Academy owner Emmanuel Edet says there is enormous talent among young Nigerian girls who can go on to become the stars of the women's national team. As such, he has called on government and corporate organizations to fund women football academies in the country. However, Edet admits that he faces a challenge of convincing parents that football is not only for boys. That year, my dad did not allow me to play ball, so I forced myself. I was as in, seeking out of home, going to play ball without his notice. But unfortunately, when I got the scholarship, he allowed me fully to play football. And with that story, we end our news brief. But remember, you can find all of our stories by checking our website, telesurenglish.net. For our viewers in Africa, you can find us on Starsat Channel 461 in South Africa and 539 in Nigeria. And you can join us on social media as well. For Telesur English, I'm Carla Gonzalez. Thank you for watching.